Kubrick and Harris made a decision to film Kubrick's next movie, 1962's Lolita, in England due to clauses placed on the contract by producers Warner Brothers that gave them complete control over every aspect of the film. Instead, they signed a $1 million deal with Elliot Hyman's Associated Artist Productions and a clause which gave them the artistic freedom that they desired. Lolita, Kubrick's first attempt at black comedy, was an adaptation of the novel of the same name by Vladimir Nabokov, the story of a middle-aged college professor becoming infatuated with a 12-year-old girl. Stylistically, Lolita, starring Peter Sellers, James Mason, Shelley Winters and Sue Lyon, was a transitional film for Kubrick, marking the turning point from a naturalistic cinema to the surrealism of the later films, according to film critic Gene Youngblood. Kubrick was deeply impressed by the chameleon-like range of actor Peter Sellers and gave him one of his first opportunities to improvise wildly during shooting, while filming him with three cameras. Kubrick often clashed with Shelley Winters, whom he found very difficult and demanding, and nearly fired her at one point. Because of its provocative story, Lolita was Kubrick's first film to generate controversy. He was ultimately forced to comply with senses and remove much of the erotic element of the relationship between Mason's Humbert and Lyon's Lolita, which had been evident in Nabokov's novel. The film was not a major critical or commercial success upon release, earning $3.7 million at the box office on its opening run. Lolita has since become acclaimed by film critics. Social historian Stephen E. Kircher documented that the film demonstrated that its director possessed a keen satiric insight into the social landscape and sexual hang-ups of Cold War America. Kubrick's next project was Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, released in 1964. Kubrick became preoccupied with the issue of nuclear war as the Cold War unfolded in the 1950s, and even considered moving to Australia because he feared that New York City might be a likely target for Russians. He studied over 40 military and political research books on the subject, and eventually reached the conclusion that nobody really knew anything and the whole situation was absurd. After buying the rights to the novel Red Alert, Kubrick collaborated with its author Peter George on the script. It was originally written as a serious political thriller, but Kubrick decided that a serious treatment of the subject would not be believable and thought that some of its most salient points would be fodder for comedy. Just before filming began, Kubrick hired noted journalist and satirical author Terry Southern to transform the script into its final form, a black comedy loaded with sexual innuendo. Kubrick found that Dr. Strangelove would be impossible to make in the US for various technical and political reasons, forcing him to move production to England. It was shot in 15 weeks, ending in April 1963, after which Kubrick spent eight months editing it. Peter Sellers again agreed to work with Kubrick and ended up playing three different roles in the film. Sellers was unable to leave the UK, so Kubrick made Britain his permanent home thereafter. The move was quite convenient to Kubrick since he shunned the Hollywood system and its publicity machine, and he and his wife Christiane had become alarmed with the increase in violence in New York. Upon release, the film stirred up much controversy and mixed opinions. The New York Times critic Bosley Crowther worried that it was a discredit and even contempt for our whole defence establishment. Kubrick responded to the criticism, stating, A satirist is someone who has a very sceptical view of human nature, but who still has the optimism to make some sort of joke out of it, however brutal that joke might be. Today the film is considered to be one of the sharpest comedy films ever made, and holds a near-perfect 99% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and it was voted the 39th greatest American film and third greatest comedy film of all time by the American Film Institute. Kubrick spent five years developing his next film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, having been highly impressed with science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke's novel Childhood's End. After meeting Clarke in New York City in April 1964, Kubrick made the suggestion to work on his 1948 short story The Sentinel, about a tetrahedron which is found on the moon, which alerts aliens of mankind. That year, Clark began writing the novel 2001 A Space Odyssey, and the screenplay was written by Kubrick and Clark in collaboration. The film's theme, The Birthing of One Intelligence by Another, 
is developed in two parallel intersecting stories on two very different time scales. One depicts transitions between various stages of man, from ape to star child, as man is reborn into a new existence, each step shepherded by an enigmatic alien intelligence seen only in its artifacts, a series of seemingly indestructible eons-old black monoliths. In space, the enemy is a supercomputer known as HAL, who runs the spaceship. Kubrick spent a great deal of time researching the film, paying particular attention to accuracy and detail on what the future might look like. He was granted permission by NASA to observe the spacecraft being used in the Ranger 9 mission for accuracy. Filming commenced on December 29, 1965, with the excavation of the monolith on the moon, with the ape scenes completed in the summer of that year. The special effects team continued working diligently until the end of the year to complete the film, taking the cost to $10.5 million. 2001, A Space Odyssey, was conceived as a Cinerama spectacle and was photographed in Super Panavision 70, giving the viewer a dazzling mix of imagination and science. Through groundbreaking effects, which earned Kubrick his only personal Oscar, an Academy Award for Visual Effects. Kubrick said of the concept of the film in an interview with Rolling Stone, on the deepest psychological level, the film's plot symbolised the search for God and finally postulates what is little less than a scientific definition of God. The film revolves around this metaphysical conception and the realistic hardware and the documentary feelings about everything when necessary in order to undermine your built-in resistance to the poetical concept. Upon release in 1968, 2001 A Space Odyssey was not an immediate hit among many critics who faulted its lack of dialogue, slow pacing and seemingly impenetrable storyline. The film appeared to defy genre convention, much unlike any science fiction movie before it and clearly different from any other of Kubrick's earlier films or stories. Kubrick was particularly outraged by a scathing review from Pauline Kael who called it the biggest amateur movie of them all, with Kubrick doing really every dumb thing he ever wanted to do. Despite the initial poor critical response, 2001 A Space Odyssey gradually gained popularity and earned $31 million worldwide by the end of 1972. Today, it is widely considered to be one of the greatest and most influential films ever made and is a staple on the all-time top 10 lists. Steven Spielberg has referred to it as the big bang of his filmmaking generation. After completing 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick searched for a project that he could film quickly on a small budget. He settled on A Clockwork Orange at the end of 1969, an exploration of violence and experimental rehabilitation by law enforcement authorities based around the character of Alex portrayed by Malcolm McDowell. Kubrick had originally received a copy of Arthur Burgess's novel of the same name from Terry Southern while they were working on Dr. Strangelove, but had rejected it on the grounds that NADSAT, the street language for young teenagers, was too difficult to comprehend. In 1969, the decision to make a film about the degeneration of youth was a more timely one. The new Hollywood movement was witnessing a great number of films that were centred around the sexuality and rebelliousness of young people, which no doubt influenced Kubrick. A Clockwork Orange was shot over the winter of 1970-71 to 71 on a budget of £2 million. Kubrick abandoned his use of cinemascope in the filming, deciding that the 1.66 to 1 widescreen format was an acceptable compromise between spectacle and intimacy, and favoured his rigorously symmetrical framing which increased the beauty of his compositions. And Stanley, why he's such a great director, for me anyway, is that he can create the atmosphere for creative work. His method of working is not to give you directions like you come in, you go from A to B and you sit down and you talk. That would be impossible to do a film in that way, um, totally impossible. If we come in at seven o'clock in the morning and we rehearse until we get the scene right. And by um, saying rehearse, I mean that everybody is there to throw in ideas. For instance, a scene in the film uh, where Alex and his three droogs come in and rape uh, a writer's wife and beat the writer up. We arrived at the set, looked at the bare walls for three days, 
Um, we rehearsed various bits of the script that we had which weren't good enough. I mean, it just didn't, wasn't working for us. On the third day, Stanley said to me, can you dance? And I said, yes, why not? You know, I went into a sort of uh, soft shoe number and started to hum. Do de do da da ba de ba de ba ba do ba, and then started to sing, singing in the rain, because um, subconsciously I remembered that scene as being one of the happiest scenes I'd ever seen on the film, and Kubrick took this immediately. Within yeah. three hours, he had the rights of the song. So I mean, he's not rigid in any sense. He's very elastic when he's working, and he may be rigid afterwards or before on the technical side of the filming. But certainly when he's working in a creative way, I mean, that's when you're actually making the film, and that's the only important thing. Because of its depiction of teenage violence, A Clockwork Orange became one of the most controversial films of the decade and part of an ongoing debate about violence and its glorification in the cinema. It received an X-rated certificate upon release just before Christmas in 1971, though many critics saw much of the violence depicted in the film as satirical and less violent than Straw Dogs, which had been released a month earlier. Kubrick personally pulled the film from release in the United Kingdom after receiving death threats following a series of copycat crimes based on the film. It was thus completely unavailable legally in the UK until after Kubrick's death, and not re-released until 2000. Negative media hype over the film notwithstanding, A Clockwork Orange received four Academy Award nominations and was named by the New York Film Critics Circle as the best film of 1971. After William Friedkin won Best Director for The French Connection that year, he told the press, Speaking personally, I think Stanley Kubrick is the best American filmmaker of the year. In fact, not just this year, but the best period. Barry Lyndon is an adaptation of William Makepeace Thackeray's The Luck of Barry Lyndon, a picaresque novel about the adventures of an 18th century Irish rogue and social climber. John Kelly of Warner Brothers agreed in 1972 to invest $2.5 million into the film on condition that Kubrick approach major Hollywood stars to ensure it of success. Like previous films, Kubrick and his art department conducted an enormous amount of research and he went from knowing very little about the 18th century at the start of the production to becoming an expert on it. Extensive photographs were taken of locations and artwork in particular, and paintings were meticulously replicated from works of the great masters of the period in the film. The film was shot on location in Ardmore, County Waterford, Ireland, beginning in the autumn of 1973 at a cost of $11 million with a cast and crew of 170. The decision to shoot in Ireland stemmed from the fact that it still retained many buildings from the 18th century period, which England lacked. The production was problematic from the start, plagued with heavy rain and political strife involving Northern Ireland at the time. After Kubrick received death threats from the IRA in the new year of 1974 due to the shooting of scenes with English soldiers, he fled Ireland with his family under an assumed identity and filming resumed in England. Baxter notes that Barry Lyndon was the film which made Kubrick notorious for paying scrupulous attention to detail often demanding 20 or 30 retakes of the same scene to perfect his art. Often considered to be his most authentic looking picture, the cinematography and lighting techniques that Kubrick and cinematographer John Alcott used in Barry Lyndon were highly innovative. Most notably, interior scenes were shot with a specially adapted high-speed camera lens, originally developed from NASA to be used in satellite photography. The lenses allowed many scenes to be lit only with candlelight, creating two-dimensional, diffuse light images reminiscent of 18th century paintings. Cinematographer Alan Davieu states that this method gives the audience a way of seeing the characters and scenes as they would have been seen by people at the time. Although Barry Lyndon found a great audience in France, it was a box office failure, grossing just 9.5 million in the American market, not even close to the $30 million Warner Brothers needed to generate a profit. The pace and length of Barry Lyndon at three hours put off many American critics and audiences, but the film was nominated for seven Academy Awards and won four, more than any other Kubrick film. As with most of Kubrick's films, Barry Lyndon's reputation has grown through the years and is now considered to be one of his best, particularly among filmmakers and critics. 
Numerous polls have rated it as one of the greatest films ever made, and it has a 96% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Roger Ebert referred to it as one of the most beautiful films ever made, certainly in every frame a Kubrick film, technically awesome, emotionally distant, remorseless in its doubt of human goodness. In 1978, Kubrick moved into Child Wickbury Manor in Hertfordshire, a mainly 18th century stately home north of London. His new home became a workplace for Kubrick and his wife, a perfect family factory as Christiane called it, and Kubrick converted the stables into extra production rooms, besides ones within the home that he used for editing and storage. A workaholic, Kubrick really took a vocation or left England during the 40 years before he died. Biographer Vincent Labrotto notes that Kubrick's combined way of living and desire for privacy has led to spurious stories about his reclusiveness, similar to those of Greta Garbo, Howard Hughes, J.D. Salinger. Michael Hur, Kubrick's co-screenwriter on Full Metal Jacket, who knew him well, considers his reclusiveness to be a myth. He was, in fact, a complete failure as a recluse, unless you believe that a recluse is simply someone who seldom leaves his house. Stanley saw a lot of people. He was one of the most gregarious men I ever knew, and it didn't change anything that most of his conviviality went on over the phone. Lobrotto states that one of the reasons he acquired a reputation as a recluse was because he insisted on remaining near his home. But the reason for this was because for Kubrick, there were only three places on the planet he could make high quality films with the necessary technical expertise and equipment. Los Angeles, New York, or around London. He disliked living in Los Angeles and had thought London a superior film production centre to New York. The Shining, released in 1980, was adapted from the novel of the same name by best-selling horror writer Stephen King. The Shining was not the only horror film to which Kubrick had been linked. He had turned down the directing of both The Exorcist and its sequel. The film stars Jack Nicholson as a writer who takes a job as a winter caretaker of a large and isolated hotel in the Rocky Mountains. He spends the winter there with his wife, played by Shelley Duval, and their young son, who displays paranormal abilities. During their stay, they confront both Jack's descent into madness and apparent supernatural horrors lurking in the hotel. Hubert gave his actors freedom to extend the script and even improvise on occasion. And as a result, Nicholson was responsible for the Here's Johnny line and scene in which he's sitting at the typewriter and unleashes his anger upon his wife. So determined to produce perfection was Kubrick, he often demanded up to 70 or 80 retakes of the same scene. Duval, who Kubrick also intentionally isolated and argued with often, was forced to perform the iconic and exhausting baseball bat scene 127 times. Afterwards, Duval presented Kubrick with clumps of the hair that had fallen out due to the extreme stress of filming. The bar scene with the ghostly bartender was shot 36 times, while the kitchen scene between the characters of Danny and Halloran ran to 148 takes. The aerial shots of the Overlook Hotel were shot at Timberline Lodge on Mount Hood in Oregon, while the interiors of the hotel were shot at Elstree Studios in England. Kubrick made extensive use of the newly invented Steadicam, a weight balance camera support, which allowed for smooth handheld camera movement in scenes where a conventional camera track was impractical. According to Garrett Brown, Steadicam's inventor, it was the first picture to use its full potential. The Shining opened to strong box office takings, earning $1 million on the first weekend and earning $30.9 million in America alone by the end of the year. The original critical response was mixed, and Stephen King himself detested the film and disliked Kubrick. Janet Maslin of the New York Times praised the airy way in which Kubrick turned an enormous building into something cramped and claustrophobic. The Shining is now considered to be a horror classic, and the American Film Institute has ranked it as the 27th greatest thriller film of all time. Kubrick met author Michael Hare in 1980 and became interested in his book Dispatches about the Vietnam War. Kubrick was also intrigued by Gustav Hasford's Vietnam War novel The Short Timers. With the vision in mind to shoot what would become Full Metal Jacket, 
Kubrick began working with both Hare and Hasford separately on the script. He eventually found Hasford's novel to be brutally honest and decided to shoot a film which closely follows the novel. All of the film was shot at a cost of $17 million within a 30 mile radius of his house between August 1985 and September 1986. A derelict gasworks in Beckton in the London's Dockland area posed as the ruined city of Hue, which makes the film visually very different from other Vietnam War films. Around 200 palm trees were imported via 40-foot trailers by road from North Africa at a cost of a thousand pounds a tree and thousands of plastic plants were ordered from Hong Kong to provide foliage for the film. Kubrick explained he made the film look realistic by using natural light and achieved a newsreel effect by making the steady cam shots less steady. The film contains some of Kubrick's trademark characteristics, such as his selection of ironic music, portrayals of men being dehumanised, and attention to extreme detail to achieve realism. The film opened strongly in June 1987, taking over $30 million in the first 50 days alone, but critically it was overshadowed by the success of Oliver Stone's Platoon, released a year earlier. According to one review, the first half of FMJ is brilliant, then the film degenerates into a masterpiece. Roger Ebert was not particularly impressed with it, awarding it a mediocre 2.5 out of 4. He concluded, Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket is more like a book of short stories than a novel, a strangely shapeless film from the man whose work usually imposes a ferociously consistent vision on his material. Kubrick's final film was Eyes Wide Shut, starring Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman as a Manhattan couple on a sexual odyssey. Tom Cruise portrays a doctor who witnesses a bizarre, masked, quasi-religious, orgiastic ritual at a country mansion, a discovery which later threatens his life. The story is based on Arthur Schnittler's 1926 Freudian novella Traum Novelle, which Kubrick relocated from turn-of-the-century Vienna to New York City in the 90s. Although Kubrick was almost 70, he worked relentlessly for 15 months to get the film out by its planned release date of July 16, 1999. He commenced a script with Frederick Raphael and worked 18 hours a day, all the while maintaining complete confidentiality about the film. Principal photography began on November 7, 1996 and ended in February 1998. Eyes Wide Shut, like Lolita and A Clockwork Orange before it, faced censorship before release. On March 7th, 1999, six days after screening a final cut of Eyes Wide Shut for his family and the stars, Kubrick died in his sleep at the age of 70 after suffering a massive heart attack. His funeral was held five days later at his home at Child Wickbury Manor with only close friends and family in attendance, totaling approximately 100 people. The media were kept a mile away outside the entrance gate. Alexander Walker, who attended the funeral, describes it as a family farewell, almost like an English picnic, with cellists, clarinetists and singers providing song and music from many of his favourite classical compositions. Kubrick never saw the final version of Eyes Wide Shut released to the public, but he did see the preview of the film with Warner Brothers, Cruz and Kidman, and he reportedly told Warner executive Julian Senior that it was my best film ever. Today, critical opinion of the film is mixed, it is viewed less favourably than most of Kubrick's films. Roger Ebert awarded it 3.5 out of 4 stars, comparing the structure to a thriller and writing that it is like an erotic daydream about chances missed and opportunities avoided, and thought that Kubrick's use of lighting at Christmas made the film all a little garish, like an urban sideshow. Which, as it happens, Reminds me of a conversation I had with Steven Spielberg about what was the most difficult and challenging thing about directing a film. And I believe Steven summed it up about as profoundly as you can. He thought the most difficult and challenging thing about directing a film was getting out of the car. I'm sure you all know the feeling. But at the same time, Anyone who has ever been privileged to direct a film also knows that although it can be like trying to write war and peace in a bumper car in an amusement park, 
When you finally get it right, there are not many joys in life that can equal the feeling. I think there's an intriguing irony in naming the Lifetime Achievement Award after D.W. Griffiths, because his career was both an inspiration and a cautionary tale. His best films will always rank among the most important films ever made, and some of them made him a great deal of money. He was instrumental in transforming movies from a Nickelodeon novelty to an art form. But Griffith was always ready to take tremendous risks in his films and in his business affairs. He was always ready to fly too high. And in the end, the wings of fortune proved for him, like those of Icarus, to be made of nothing more substantial than wax and feathers. And like Icarus, when he flew too close to the sun, they melted. And the man whose fame exceeded the most illustrious filmmakers of today, spent the last 17 years of his life shunned by the film industry he had created. I've compared Griffith's career to the Icarus myth, but at the same time, I've never been certain whether the moral of the Icarus story should only be, as is generally accepted, don't try to fly too high, or whether it might also be thought of as forget the wax and feathers and do a better job on the wings. One thing, however, is certain. D.W. Griffith left us with an inspiring and intriguing legacy. And the award in his name is one of the greatest honors a film director can receive. Something for which I humbly thank all of you very much.